little bit extra time for folks to join us. All right. Looks like that number is leveling off. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today uh, for today's CNCF webinar, Enabling Cloud Native Storage for the Enterprise. My name is Ariel Jatib. I'm a CNCF ambassador. I'm also a business development manager for Cloud Native Technologies, uh, a company called NetApp. Uh, today, uh, uh, I'm actually moderating a talk by, with a couple of my colleagues. I'd like to welcome uh, Chris Mertz, principal technologist and George Storani, product leader for Kubernetes and Cloud Native Data, uh, also at NetApp. A couple of housekeeping uh, items uh, before we get started. During the webinar, you're not going to be able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box right at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there, and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. Uh, reminder, this is an official uh, webinar of the CNCF, and as such, subject to the CNCF's code of conduct, Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the code of conduct. Basically, uh, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please note uh, that the recording and slides will be posted later today uh, to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io forward slash webinars. Uh, uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Chris and George for today's presentation. All right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Ariel. Um, hi. Nice to nice to be on today. Very very happy to uh, for to be on a CNCF webinar um, and be able to talk a little bit about how uh, how we've been enabling cloud storage, uh, cloud native storage uh, for the enterprise, including uh, our enterprise, uh, our our customers, uh, and today. Uh, I'll be presenting along uh, with my colleague, George Tirani. And uh, George has been leading our, our uh, product efforts around Kubernetes and cloud native uh, data storage for, for a number of years now. Um, my name is uh, Chris Mers. I'm principal technologist in the NetApp hybrid cloud group. And my focus has been uh, for the last several years on DevOps and cloud native technologies. So um, to get things started today, um, Here's our list of objectives, uh, basically, you know, uh, our agenda for the day. We're going to talk a little bit about the state of state. Uh, George is going to kick it off with that. And then uh, I will go ahead and talk about the inside view. How is this, uh, how has how Kubernetes and, and cloud native affected uh, our organization, uh, NetApp in that case? Um, and we'll go through how it's affected us internally um, and spurred in, uh, internal transformations. Um, how Kubernetes and cloud native technologies have affected our product and GTM strategic response and how we resource uh, various products and, and efforts, uh, engineering resources, et cetera. And uh, we'll talk about a few example end user cloud native storage architectures um, that our customers are putting in place today. And, um, and then hand it back over to George. He'll talk about uh, principles of cloud native storage and then we'll, uh, we'll close it out. So uh, without Further ado, I will hand it over to my colleague and friend George Tirani uh, for a little bit about the state of state in cloud Thank native you. storage. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good day. Hope you are well and safe in these crazy times. And we really appreciate you joining us for this webinar this afternoon. Um, one of the level set, if you could go to the next slide, please, Chris, if you don't mind. And Chris is driving today, so bear with us. Um, Kind of level said, you know, kind of preaching to the choir, I guess, uh, you know, stateless indeed is for, for TV. Uh, maybe uh, the only application that I know that genuinely has no state is uh, Hello World. But any workload, I think we can agree on this, that any workload of value to the enterprise uh, needs to uh, be persistent. In fact, if you, uh, uh, if you have a look at the, uh, the Docker Hub, seven out of the 10 top images are, are stateful applications. So, I, you know, even the most basic applications, I think, uh, you require some kind of state. Um, for instance, take uh, Windows Notepad. You notice if you uh, change the view option to wrap sentences, next time you launch Notepad, it remembers to do that exactly. So, so the, the point of the, uh, the, the gist of the, uh, you know, what we're trying to say here is that indeed, um, whether you're running databases, line of business applications, you're uh, lifting and shifting 
monolithic applications into containers or even um, starting brand new cloud native applications, persistence and storage uh, is a must. So um, with that said, and by the way, for those of you who are not familiar with this show, Stateless, it's a great one. Um, I, you know, I think it's coming on uh, Netflix, uh, so I strongly recommend it. Anyway, with that said, let's go to the next slide, please, Chris. Very good. So, uh, you know, they say, you know, you never know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. So in a prehistoric days of containers, the uh, main objective was to uh, basically accomplish the bare minimum, which was to connect external storage to your containers. Um, so what most storage vendors did, uh, NetApp included, was that we would develop our own volume plugin. In fact, I think NetApp was the first one that um, published uh, a plugin for, uh, for Docker back in the uh, early uh, 2010s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, by 2016, I think it was noticeable that there was a shift to Kubernetes and, and this, this sort of ushered in a whole new set of users that weren't particularly storage experts. And so as a result, uh, they wanted to manage data from the Kubernetes level, not necessarily have to do it at the storage level. In some cases, they didn't even have access to storage because uh, as you well know, uh, and still this is probably true, that most organizations have a storage admin class that basically manage the entire you know, uh, storage infrastructure. But these new users wanted to bypass the storage admins altogether and get to and manage the data uh, from, from the Kubernetes level. And this was a catalyst for NetApp basically transforming our open source posture and the way we contributed to the community. We uh, merged our Docker code with a new branch of code uh, for Kubernetes and named it Project Triton. Some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, this is, uh, it's got a bit of a cult following. This project was the first external provisioner for Kubernetes. And now fast forwarding to today um, and what a crazy year 2020 has been, right? First, we almost started World War III, then the Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stepped down from the Royals, and of course, now the global pandemic and COVID-19. Um, now, while all those events haven't directly impacted the open source ecosystem, it certainly has indirectly had an effect. I mean, for instance, KubeCon was postponed, unfortunately. Um, and one could make the case that the, 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 you know, this period has allowed us to reassess our current predicament, maybe reevaluate our wants and needs. So, one of those related to the, you know, um, to this particular discussion is that, you know, Kubernetes users want Kubernetes and containers and associated data with it to go together. They also want uh, some form of a de facto standard for what makes up an application in Kubernetes. As you well know, there is not a standard today. Some folks have uh, their own interpretations, but there isn't one that, you know, the community follows as a whole. Um, and you know the basic, you know the application currently is a, is a loose connection uh, collection of uh, Kubernetes objects. The, the point is that um, you know we have some work to do as a community, but I'm glad that the, this community is focusing its attention um, to operations that matter, like application consistent backup and restore, full stack application migration, uh, disaster recovery, and so forth in a multi cluster and a multi cloud environment. Next slide, please. So I uh, stole this from CNCF website. As you see, as evidenced by this chart, the, uh, the cloud native storage ecosystem is very vibrant. Uh, and it's really a collection of innovative vendors who come from all walks of life, um, and which adds flavor and depth to how the community approaches, uh, you know, building out solutions for workloads and containers. Now, admittedly, um, some have a more profound understanding and impact uh, because they bring in decades of experience in a multifaceted way, you know, meaning not not just solely focused on storage, but you know, take NetApp for instance. Uh, you know, NetApp's been around for 20 some odd years. Uh, um, been sort of a, and recently in, uh, in the past, recent past, the NetApp has been one of the most active contributors to the open source community, and has successfully re-engineered itself to, to become a hybrid cloud vendor. And and you know, we're able to draw from deep storage expertise as well as combining that with the mastery of Kubernetes. So. Um, this space, uh, as, they, as they say, watch it, it's growing. It's, uh, we believe we're uh, better aligning ourselves with customers' needs and wants, and we hope to cover some of, those to some of those topics today. Here's Chris. All right, thanks, George. Um, so bearing in mind that, that what I'm gonna present over the next few minutes is not um, necessarily uh, in serial. You know, this is, a, this is what's happened over the last four years. And a lot of these uh, changes have happened kind of um, in a flowing manner. So 
the, what I'm going to show you in the next set of slides is basically a condensation of what we've done over the last four years as uh, Kubernetes has gained popularity in the marketplace and eventually uh, won the orchestrator wars. So the inside view, 25 years of data storage meets cloud native, and it's actually 27, I think now, something like that. So we'll start out with this, this quote from William Gibson, the future is here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And, and that's how I would describe um, cloud native technologies in general, but especially cloud native storage and advanced uh, cloud native storage architectures and uh, requirements. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, uh, for our organization, you know, let's take uh, NetApp IT, for instance, your standard corporate IT department, as, as almost as, you know, pretty much down the, down the middle uh, center of the road as you can get. Um, so we came from a waterfall background. We, you know, we transitioned to Agile, um, you know, have been transitioning to Agile across the board for the last uh, number of years. And it used to look like, like this, you know, you got your, your uh, you know, semi-annual releases, and then, you know, you start moving to Agile, you get your two-week sprints. Um, but in the modern world, modern app development, um, our developers wanted to be able to push apps faster. Uh, we wanted to be able to get new capabilities out to our internal users uh, with our corporate apps faster. Um, we need to be more responsive. We need to be more responsive to the C-level, to marketing, to, to sales, all the things, you know, that happen in a shifting marketplace. Um, when you need to get, uh, you know, when, when things change or you need to get new capabilities out to, to customers quickly, really the only option is to do CICD, right? Or, or you know, things that we would consider cloud native today. Um, things that kind of came from DevOps and have transitioned uh, to be baked into cloud native. Things like CICD, self-healing self architectures, auto-scaling, stuff like that. Um, so approaching this, this problem for us, so if you're going to go cloud native everywhere, um, Let's discuss real quickly, you know, what's a cloud, right? You, if, you're, if you're going to be cloud native everywhere, both in the public cloud and on premises and create hybrid clouds, you know, to be able to do uh, Kubernetes, containers, microservices, other types of cloud native uh, technologies and patterns everywhere, you have to basically extend the cloud. So each cloud has, you know, a, a compute service for VMs. Um, you know, they, there's also a block storage service um, also probably an object uh, storage service, probably also a file storage service, um, maybe containers as a service uh, or Kubernetes as a service, some type of star KS, um, and then monitoring and observability to kind of tie it all together. And, and every cloud follows this basic pattern of surfacing physical resources uh, into services that are consumable um, as metered uh, pay by the drip services for end users. Well, on premises, if you're going to create a cloud, um, especially with an eye towards cloud native, you've got to do the same thing. You've got to have a compute service. You might be doing all kinds of things with that, including serving regular VMs, maybe uh, VDI, which is just another form of VM. These are things that uh, corporate entities you know, run into all the time. Um, then you also have this modern app development. You've got containers as a service. You've got uh, some type of Kubernetes service involved, um, depending on what, what flavor uh, of Kubernetes your organization is going down. Um, and then, of course, particular to, to corporate entities and on-prem, uh, you've got a lot of biz apps to deal with. So that's a little bit of, of a different story, but there's analogs for that in the cloud as well. Um, then object storage, file storage, block storage, monitoring observability. So cloud is a cloud is a cloud is a cloud. Um, it depends on how you architect it. So moving forward, what is, what, so you build the cloud. What's, what, is, what, is, what, what makes this a cloud native experience? Well, it's really about Ease of use is, is a great, you know, is one big part of it. Um, it's not just about the technology. It's about how you deliver it and how you consume it. Um, so it calls cloudy with a chance of IaaS on premises, right? Um, so folks are looking for stuff that's always available, self-service, serial lead time, containers focused, you know, capable of workload portability so that you're not running into lead times or waiting on trouble tickets. You know, everything's moving pretty much generally as, as fast as possible in the oiled machine. So what does that mean for architects? Well, you've got to have self-healing designs, uh, ways to create catalogs easy for self-service. Uh, you want this all to be API driven so you can integrate it with uh, DevOps automation platforms and, and tools of various types, um, should be Kubernetes compliant, and have hybrid cloud extensions you know, to be able to extend uh, the, what's on-premises into the public clouds and back. Um, so what does this mean for you know, corporate IT, uh, evolving corporate IT leaders? <laughs> Congratulations, IT, you are now a cloud service provider. Um, so these are the types of things that uh, folks who are uh, cloud enabling or cloud, you know, enabling cloud native within 
their data center uh, have to deal with now. So, so how did we go about that? Did, you know, we realized that FIT uh, basically realized, okay, now we're a cloud service provider. What are we going to do about that? Um, so this is how we, we organized ourselves, you know, kind of a DevOps model, uh, hub and spoke, um, you know, line of business, uh, app dev teams, you know, with a, with kind of an SRE role baked into that going into what we call our IT one cloud, right. Um, which is, uh, this is not a product we're selling. So just, a just a caveat there. This is just an explanation of what our internal systems look like uh, for NetApp IT. Um, so we use a lot of industry products. Uh, a lot of these, most of these should be familiar with the folks on the call. Um, and these are things that have to do with either our internal predilections uh, for app development, um, as well as our partnerships. Because um, our internal IT systems, we, we tend to drink our own champagne, eat our own dog food, that type of thing. Um, so we try to incorporate as many of our uh, tech, tech partner integrations as possible um, so that we're absolutely sure that uh, we're getting primary feedback from our own internal teams that those those third-party platforms are built on top of uh, an amalgamated NetApp platform which has some of our uh, storage and infrastructure products in it as well as uh, trident which george mentioned earlier which is open source um, which basically is the the connector uh, for doing persistent volume claims and uh, intelligent storage orchestration etc for cloud native workloads so this is what uh, Basically, this took several years, you know, to get to this point, but now we're running um, basically cloud native, you know, container space, Kubernetes driven, CI, CD, et cetera, so forth to a hybrid cloud, a hybrid multi-cloud, if you will, um, because we're extending into all three uh, public clouds. So that's, that's how Kubernetes and, and cloud native technologies and especially cloud native storage have impacted us internally. So what about how it impacts our product strategy and has impacted our product strategy over the last several years. Well, this is what I like to call the, the impetus for, for, the, for the huge change, uh, you know, or the power behind it, C4, um, cloud consumer consumption context. So you've got new cloud native consumers, what is their consumption context? And these customer needs that we got directly from, from our customers and prospects translated into our product strategy over the last several years. So what we learned was that you know, folks who organizations, enterprises who are in transition need VMs and Kubernetes to coexist in relative harmony. That's a desire. Um, there are certain flavors of Kubernetes that are dominating the commercial marketplace. Um, you know, you've got you know, your Anthos and your OpenShift and various other uh, flavors coming in, Tanzu and Pacific, all kinds of good stuff going on in the commercial sector. Um, but it's, of course, it all comes back down to open source, right? And folks are shifting their mindset from storage to persistence layers. You know, it's not about uh, storage volumes or LUNs. It's about, um, you know, a flexible persistence layer that, that I can then, you know, basically it's, it's programmatic. I can just, you know, put a config in a YAML file and less than a second later, there's my storage. Right? Um, so all of our future storage services and products uh, must be Kubernetes ready. That's what, another thing we learned. And we need parity. Uh, between the VM data services that we've been providing for years and Kubernetes data services. Also, a huge, huge, huge part of this is work, workload mobility. We've been talking about app mobility ad infinitum for, for a number of years with containers. And that's all well and good. You know, as George talked about at the top of the talk, you know, stateless apps work really well that way. You basically kill them here, bring them up over there, and it looks like it moved. Um, but what if there's data associated with that? What if there's a tight coupling of data associated with that uh, application? What if it is a data rich application? Um, then in order to make that portable, um, you actually have to move the app and the data in concert. And that's workload mobility. True workload mobility is hard to come by. And the folks that are doing it today are generally rolling their own or using one of the, you know, the non-standard, um, you know, capabilities that exist today. Um, but this is a, a problem that is currently being solved. It is not solved yet. So how did that how did that translate into our product strategy? Well, we became a founding member of the CNCF, um, and, and I'm saying this, this is not a brag slide. I really I want to get this across. This is simply me sharing what we did as a corporate entity to respond to a shift shift in the marketplace, um, and, and we've been very successful with that. So I just wanted to you know kind of give you give you all the inside view. So uh, joined the CNCF as a founding member. Um, significant ongoing engineering investment in our uh, CSI Trident provider, which is open source. More than welcome to come take a look, download it from GitHub, you know, um, submit changes, whatever you'd like. Um, we had contributions to the creation of the CSI uh, also ongoing. Um, we did uh, mandate and, and provide 
Kubernetes integration for all our current future products and services. That's not a blanket statement, but all those that make sense. Um, and then we're still going through a massive application modernization effort that includes all of our, our base products. So, um, you know, constantly working with engineering teams and, and seeing how they're basically containerizing and turning our service, you know, various products that have maybe so architectures into microservice architectures. Um, and some of them were born that way, Greenfield, and, and the rest were, were transitioning. Um, also, you know, made, made great efforts to, uh, to work with the public cloud providers to provide tier one storage services and partnerships, um, validated hybrid architectures with, with uh, self-same partners and, and other third party uh, vendors. This is to cover the, the commercial enterprise space and to spread you know, the goodness of, of Kubernetes and uh, cloud native technologies as far as we can. Um, and of course, you know, uh, microservice architectures underpin a lot of our cloud data services that are in production today. Um, so here's just a quick example, anonymized customer use case. Uh, it's a major global network vendor. Um, and I was able to kind of help uh, set the, the stage for the architecture here um, for their internal development cloud. And, and it's basically as straightforward as you get. You got developers uh, producing um, you know, containers, which are then orchestrated by Kubernetes, and uh, then tried into the peanut butter layer that attaches the persistent storage to um, to the entire system. And this allowed them to accelerate their timelines, improve their scalability and reliability, et cetera. Also, uh, global IT services vendor. You know, this is a more, a more generic use case. This allows them to provide cloud native uh, services to their customers um, around the globe. And they chose um, to you know, use OpenShift, uh, which is a you know, upstream uh, brand of, of Kubernetes, uh, or close to it. and you know, using the the right type of cloud infrastructure um, on premises enabled them to basically revamp um, their global systems for modern application development. Another example uh, is a media and entertainment company in EMEA, um, and they are heavily data driven, uh, lots of media and data rich applications, all orchestrated by Kubernetes, and uh, most of their you know applications are are obviously containers based and. You know, in this case, it was more complex. They were using a lot of object storage. They wanted to make it geo-distributed, uh, create a containers as a service platform, as they called it, and, uh, you know, and to ensure there was data mobility between their systems. And this allowed them to, of course, you know, achieve the faster performance and, you know, um, the ROI improvements that they were looking for. So, you know, I've talked a lot about, you know, how uh, Kubernetes has basically informed our own internal transformations, how it's affected our product strategy, go-to-market strategy, partnership strategy, um, as well as uh, how this has translated into you know, our customers' uh, transformations and, and basically movements towards cloud-native technologies and cloud-native storage. So now we're sitting at this point, and what I've noticed is that right now, even acceleration is accelerating. There's a lot that either Right now, it can be an opportunity um, to accelerate some of the, the, the changes and transformations that we've been undergoing um, in the enterprise and corporate environments. And so um, I think it's time to kind of look at, at the horizon line and say, okay, what's, what's next? Are we going to have standards for workload mobility? What is, what is the community going to, to settle upon? Um, and with that, I would like to hand it back over to George, and he can uh, show us a bit more about what's next. Thank you, Chris. You know, one thing you said that actually resonated with me, honestly, and that is things are accelerating much faster than before, aren't they? I remember when I was a kid, the, you know, the world changed every 10, 15 years. Now it seems it's changing yeah. every month. Yeah, no, it's, it seems like it's, uh, you know, it's, what's uh, terminal velocity. It's uh, basically we're, acceleration is accelerating. It's, it's, yeah. um, it's, a, it's a bit mind blowing at, at, at times, but uh, yeah, take sure. it away. Sure is. Thank you. So we wanted to share with you just the, you know, what we've learned uh, from you and, and folks like you in the community and, of course, our customers. Uh, and I realize the, the priority of, uh, of this list might vary. It's relative. But I think the, the characteristics of what essentially make up uh, an ideal cloud native storage infrastructure for, for a Kubernetes environment, I think these generally cover the entire gamut. So um, cloud native should be highly available and, you know, uh, 
good tiered performance SLA. The container needs to know that it's running inside containers. Um, it, it should, uh, you know, wholly and completely embrace upstream Kubernetes and avoid deep integration or customization with branded distributions. There's nothing wrong with it, but we believe in order to, to you know, in the spirit of keeping things open, uh, you know, we embrace as, a, as an organization upstream Kubernetes. Last but not least, the world has changed, as we just said. Uh, not everything's on-prem anymore, and not everything's going to be in the cloud either. Uh, it's going to be somewhere in between. Can you go to the next slide for me, please, uh, Chris? So just kind of uh, drilling down a little bit on these, what, is that, what do I mean by availability and high performance? Uh, you know, SLAs are, of course, important, right? You need robustness in the organization to make sure your applications stay up, and that, is, that should also apply to your cloud-native storage. Um, performance, of course, you need, the, whether it's IOPS, latency, or, or bandwidth, <clears throat> all these uh, characters and parameters are, are important to, to maintaining a, uh, a storage infrastructure that is consistent with the level of consumption uh, as far as the applications are concerned. Um, good cloud native platforms should, you know, uh, be supported by their respective vendors um, because not all organizations can can solely depend on their own internal IT to, to do the problem solving, do the integration and consulting and so forth. Um, at the end of the day, particularly for multinationals and large organizations, be it a financial institution, you're, a, you're an automotive manufacturer or any other top vertical, uh, having that support, of course, on a global scale is critically important. And the operational experience that, that I'm referring here is really that sort of that SRE sort of angle, right? It's one thing to know how one's hardware or software is architected and, and what its limitations are and how it operates. But to actually do it in a, in a real life situation in a real data center, um, managing a variety of different types of use cases across the board, that level of experience, it's gotta be sole service with all kinds of automation and, and you know, uh, have a, an observability angle, right? Um, it's very important that the, the infrastructure teams understand their place in terms of where they are. Critically important to the organization when it comes to standing up services. But I think at the end of the day, the ideal scenario is to make the consumption model such that as users, we don't necessarily have to go to the source every time we want to make a quick modification or make a request. And last but not least, it needs to be programmable, right? If you want to deploy this at scale, um, uh, you, you have to have the mechanism and the tooling to be able to do this uh, in, a, in, a, in a fully automated way. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so why it's important to, to know, to, for the uh, cloud uh, native storage to know that it's uh, um, running uh, a, in a container environment? Um, because it understands what the consumption model is. It really goes back to that. Um, it also needs to integrate with the storage services in the cloud. Um, I, uh, uh, I read somewhere recently that 47% uh, of enterprise workloads now run in some form or fashion in the cloud. If that's the case, then uh, th this is the new reality. And, and, and as such, the uh, cloud native infrastructure also needs to understand it, which means that if you're running your application today on-prem and you decide to the next day run it in the cloud, there has to be toolings and mechanisms and, and, and software and intelligence that knows how to move data back and forth in a way that it stands up the application it's in its entirety, uh, not in pieces, not just the volumes, not just the ap application pods, it's gotta be a complete solution. Um, it also needs to a, a, a robust and, and solid uh, cloud native storage infrastructure needs to provide you additional storage tools for the infrastructure folks. So as I said, the, the storage teams aren't going away. You'll always need that level of expertise. You may not need them for every particular, you know, op these in order to manage storage at scale. And of course, bringing it back to the user and application level. Uh, basic data management functions uh, and data manipulation capabilities have to be available at the user level from the Kubernetes uh, uh, sort of uh, perspective. Um, you know, snapshots shouldn't be exclusive to, to storage administrators. Uh, if, as, a, as a development manager, you know, cloning capabilities should be readily available to the users and not something that is exclusive to the storage team. So some of the other characteristics that we think are critical. Next slide, please. 
Uh, native integration upstream and downstream. What I really mean by this is obviously CSI is a great step forward. Um, it, it, it sort of democratizes the way, you know, um, uh, container orchestrators interface with the, the underlying storage. Um, but of course, it's, it's early days and, and it, you know, needs to mature more. And, and we realize as, as, you know, participants in the community and vendors who cater to customers that, you know, we need to do more and we need to do better. Um, so, so that part, I think it's going to take its own course. Um, and, and I think everyone is comfortable with the idea. Uh, but in terms of uh, additional uh, surfacing up additional capabilities and features that exist in the, in, in the storage infrastructure, it, 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 you know, the idea is, uh, I, I hinted to this earlier, uh, embracing the, uh, the, the sort of pure upstream uh, Kubernetes is, is important. Now, you may choose to go with a distribution that has particular tools and provides additional application level feature sets that are important. Um, so long that the container orchestration piece uh, is, is untouched and is consistent with the uh, with upstream Kubernetes, I think that, that, is the, that is the key factor that differentiates it. And, and the other part is uh, downstream with the actual, you know, the, the integration itself. Um, in the case of NetApp, for instance, we talked about Trident. Trident is NetApp's integration for Kubernetes. see what it's comprised of, what it's doing. So there are no sort of pockets of proprietary uh, uh, IP, intellectual property uh, in those integrations. Uh, next slide, please. And I believe this is the last one of the, of the four, right? So I hope you guys can hear me okay. Apologies if I'm dropping off. I seem to lose packets here and there. So, um, and, and finally, the, uh, the, the hybrid cloud, uh, cloud use case, um, the cloud-like um, on-demand uh, elastic and scalability in a way that uh, how consumers use, um, uh, run their applications in the cloud. Um, and of course, uh, the, the Kubernetes infrastructure that supports those deployments, right? So whether they're hosted or they're on-prem or hybrid environment, the, the idea behind a genuine cloud native storage infrastructure is to be able to accommodate all of those. Now, there are many tens of Kubernetes distributions that are out there, but it's important that the, um, you know, native to uh, particular cloud service providers, as well as the, the, the major distributions. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Sorry about that. I'm, I'm getting some message that some of you may not hear me. So, uh, let me just repeat myself one more time. I, my reference was to the, the, the cloud-like consumption uh, of storage uh, in line with how applications are consumed. And of course, last but not least, uh, basic data management capabilities when it comes to, to storage. Being able to back up your important data, but not just the volume itself. This is the data in the, in the context of full stack application consistency so that you could back up your data, application data, and stand it up in a different cluster or in a different cloud altogether in its entirety uh, for a variety of reasons, whether you, you, know, uh, you wanna have a, uh, uh, be able to quickly switch over to a different environment and or you're doing this as a means of, for instance, uh, if you're having a, um, a sort of data Chris, could you switch over to the next slide, please? Guys, apologies. Uh, my bandwidth seems to be a little bit unreliable here. I hope you can hear me. Um, I can hear you, George. Okay, very good. Sorry about that. Um, I'm actually connected directly to my uh, router here, but I think everyone's home these days, and this is understandable, right? I know how many of you folks uh, get on Zoom or very, various other sort of collaboration software these days and uh, so freezing and losing packets it seems to be a, a, a you know commonality these days so I apologize uh, in any event um, one additional sort of uh, component that I, I might suggest in terms of you know what to consider for your cloud native infrastructure is to to understand and, and sort of uh, you know vet you know the idea of making sure that the these uh, 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 this type of st uh, storage provides the uh, coverage for uh, all most, if not all, use cases, and and there's some 
in the deployment model, whether or not it runs uh, in, the in the cloud or on-prem, and or uh, as far as the storage uh, backend itself is concerned. Chris, if you go to the next uh, slide, please. Excellent. So just wanted to close out, uh, and again, I hope you guys can hear me, and apologies for the unreliability of my internet connection here. Um, so wanted to just quickly talk about Trident. We made references to it a number of times. This is a NetApps integration for Kubernetes. It's an open source project and it's been around, I guess by uh, Kubernetes standards uh, for eons, it's been around since 2016 actually. So um, it's, a, it's a Kubernetes native application, uh, which is to say it runs as a container in a cluster. Um, uh, the, the operator, the Trident operator, um, monitors the obviously Kubernetes API server and when it sees a storage request or a PVC come in, it processes that in real storage backend. Uh, it quickly sets up paths between the containers and the backend NetApp storage. Um, Trident uh, uh, is, uh, as I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open source software solution. It leaves a very small footprint on every node. So you only need to run one copy of Trident per cluster. So it's very lightweight. Um, and I think importantly, from, from the performance uh, standpoint, because it is a control object, very much like Kubernetes itself, Trident's not in the data path, so it really doesn't have any impact on performance. Chris, back to you. All right, thanks, George. Um, just uh, as George mentioned, a little bit uh, about Trident here, and if you'd like to, to learn more about the open source project, try to go to netapp.io or check out our GitHub at uh, github.com slash netapp slash trident. And with that, I'd like to just leave you with this, this consideration. It's not the most intellectual of species that survives. It's not even the strongest that survives, but uh, the species that survives is the one that is able to adapt and adjust best to the changing environment. Um, that is a, a quality that humans have above all is adaptability. Um, and what we're finding is that uh, you know, tech, tech companies and enterprises and corporations in the space, especially those that have been around for quite some time, um, can choose to either adapt or perish. Um, so with that, uh, for more information, um, if you'd like to join us in our developer and open source community, there's netapp.io or the pub. There's also cloud.netapp.com, which is where you'll find out uh, more about um, various uh, things that we're doing in that space. Also our GitHub, Slack, Twitter. Um, and by all means, please reach out to us. More than happy to engage in conversation. Um, and I think that is it. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ariel and I think we're going to do some Q and A. Yeah. So uh, awesome. Uh, awesome. Thanks, uh, Chris and George for the presentation. Um, we have some time for questions. Again, uh, you can use the Q&A tab down at the bottom or just drop them into chat. Um, in listening to the talk, and, and especially uh, uh, kind of dovetailing a little bit on your Darwin quote, Chris, uh, can you speak a little bit to the barriers that the, the, the IT team uh, at NetApp encountered in uh, adopting cloud native uh, uh, technologies? Yeah, sure can. I think that, you know, when I've talked many, many times with, with our IT team about, about their transformations over the years, starting with, with DevOps and then moving into cloud native. And really the biggest barriers that, that they encountered um, were, were mostly cultural. You know, getting folks to understand that just because you're changing consumption context, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily that, that what you know is becoming obviated or outdated. It just means that you're grafting new, uh, new best practices and, and new modalities onto a worldview that you already have. So once people start viewing these transitions as career enhancers, career enablers, uh, growth, growth opportunities, rather than uh, necessarily being concerned about you know, uh, resisting change, I mean, to put it bluntly, um, that's, that's where you get past the first big bottleneck. Um, and after that, it, it becomes a matter of assessing the organization's needs and then seeing what, what are your biggest blockers to tackle? What's going to be the, you know, the biggest blocker that's in the way technically. Um, and fortunately, thanks to the work that had been done with Trident, uh, you know, in parallel, uh, we had, we, we greased the wheels a lot on that one. Cool. And, and to dig into that, uh, uh, 
into Trident and storage a little bit. Can you all kind of uh, discuss a little bit uh, some best practices for data backup and recovery uh, in this in this uh, cloud native context? George, do you want to handle that? Or of course, yeah, sure. Be happy to. Hope you guys can hear me. Um, yes, absolutely. So. Uh, Actually, to, to the Triton users out there, I, I have one advice, and, and if you don't already know about this, uh, we, uh, we have a website which we affectionately call the pub, which is netapp.io. This is the home of all things open source at NetApp, uh, including Trident. And as part of that, we actually have published a four-part series of technical blogs that specifically cover that very topic, Ariel, which is uh, backup and restore uh, by uh, by the way of using Triton. Now, Triton itself, as I mentioned at the onset, uh, is not a an application uh, or a, or a backup application. I should say it is is really generally the means of integrating your Kubernetes environment to the to the backend net, network storage that is based on NetApp storage systems. But we do have best practices that specifically cover that. And actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to make a quick little segue and, and uh, plug something to those folks who are still listening to, to us. Um, on the 22nd of April, um, NetApp is making some interesting announcements in our opinion. It's something that we're quite excited about. And it particularly targets this very topic, which is about application awareness, application. Yeah, what George is right. talking about is is our uh, yeah we we are definitely going to be talking more about this next week. So uh, tune in on on uh, the various channels, and it, yeah. it's pretty exciting. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. So uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for the presentation again, uh, and thanks to all the attendees for uh, uh, joining us today. Again, the webinar recording and the slides will be available later uh, today, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next. Uh, CNCF webinar. Uh, have a great day. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks, everyone.